Hello and welcome to the today's session. Accelerate your online e-commerce sales through the performance rate optimization, conversion, social media marketing strategies, online uh, event which is hosted by digital entrepreneurs and uh, LinkedIn Mastermind Group. So once again, guys, thank you so much for taking time out and being here. My name is Sanya Sarma, founder and chairman of Extreme SEO Internet Solutions. Today we have a very uh, well diversified panel of guest speakers here who are specialized in conversion rate optimization and advanced digital marketing strategies, social media marketing, social media optimization and social media management uh, the strategies as well as uh, we have people who are, uh, who are really uh, practical experts in particular relevant dom domains. And uh, before we dive into the main session, I'm humbly requesting all the participants to follow the uh, housekeeping things. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type into the question box on your right hand side. And also, if you really want to ask any question in your question and answer time, there's an option where you can wave your hands. So we will pick the relevant question to the relevant uh, panel speaker. And we will make sure that if, you, if your question is something related to the panelist, definitely we will bring it. And when you're raising your question, please make sure you are giving just one question, not a bunch of questions. Okay, all good? Perfect. So uh, today's speakers, we have very great speakers over here. Mr. Khalid Shah from uh, Invespi. He's the CEO and founder of uh, Invespi. He's good at conversion rate optimization strategies. And we have Rajida Dhanayaka, CEO of eMarketing Eye. And we have uh, Ruthi Siranayaka, social media strategist from Blueprint Technologies. And once again, guys, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, taking your time to be here. Today, agenda is going to be a bit of formal, like I said before. Rajida is going to talk about uh, digital marketing, especially uh, if you're running an e-commerce business website or e-commerce business like a dropshipping, you can learn um, the advanced digital marketing and performance marketing strategy from him. And uh, so without any further ado, we'll dive into the main presentation. Let's start with Khalid. So uh, Khalid, could you please give us a short background about yourself and why you get into the conversion rate optimization as your prime career? Sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back to the 2000s. Uh, so okay. It's always a funny story to, to mention. Uh, I used to be actually a, an e-commerce software architect. Um, and I worked for Fortune 500 companies. So I did uh, American Express. Uh, the competitor of Zoom was actually my last, uh, my last assignment, go to meeting, go to webinar. Wow. Um, and back in 2005, um, I was one of three architects that helped Motorola build their e-commerce website. $35 million dollar investment huge investment 120 engineers for me as a software architect it was a dream come true because i got to choose whatever portions i work on whatever portions i assign to to my developers uh long story short we we do development in three months which is incredible for a full-fledged enterprise e-commerce website we launched the site we had 16 servers sun micro uh, system servers so those are beefy servers and within an hour, those servers crash. So um, I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, like, you know, we got so much traffic, so many visitors come to the site. Okay, I, I was worried about the number of visitors who were gonna be aware about, uh, about the site. So obviously they did not have a problem with traffic. We bring the servers back up. I'm excited, I'm really happy. A month later, for the $35 million investment, Motorola had about 10 orders. Um, if, you do, if you do the math, that is just one horrible ROI. Um, and that's actually how I got started on conversion rate uh, optimization. Um, mm -hmm. we were, when we started Invesp, we were the second company in the U.S. to focus uh, solely on conversion rate optimization. Now there are thousands of companies do that, but we were one of the early companies that, that focused on that, on that field. So over the years, we've worked with both large enterprise clients and we've also worked with fast growing startups so ebay for example is a long time client 3m <laughs> ericsson and at the same time i have so many small startups that if i mentioned the names people wouldn't wouldn't recognize them that's how i got started with uh, with cro and the rest is history as they say okay that's something really amazing that you work with zoom as well 
the oh, with, no, with no with with go to meeting actually the go to meeting. Okay, so yes. The yes yes that's yes. a very amazing thing okay so let's dive into um rajita so uh rajita could you please tell us a bit more about your company and how did you get into this career hi so i just um I'll tell you a bit about you know how i got into this e-commerce um my first job was back in 2000 so i've been doing this for about 20 years now um so what happened was like i always want to do something different because if you look at year 2000 uh, e-commerce is unknown in sri lanka and digital marketing is not something that no one is interested to i mean i don't think it was it was anywhere but i want to do something related to marketing and it so then i saw this opportunity uh, this company called seshanet that you know they want an e-commerce executive so i just went to the office and just fall in love with the environment uh, i was like okay i don't mind uh, coming here and sweeping the office because that was that pretty so i was just after school so it was just uh, not a planned decision to go into e-commerce i just wanted to do something different which actually sort of helped me to get into e-commerce or uh, you call it uh, e-marketing those days um uh, so what happened was that then started a lot of self learning and fall in love with what we have to do because it involves a bit of technical knowledge uh, and marketing knowledge both um so that's that's how i got into e-commerce uh, or e digital marketing and in seven years down the line then i decided that okay why why not um, you know setting up a company because i think that is one of the best decisions i've ever made uh, because uh, you tend to learn a lot of things uh, when when you start um start experimenting and when you're setting up your own thing helps you to do it more um so that actually how i got into it and since then uh, we've been focusing on a couple of verticals travel has been our specialty because since day one you know even the first company i joined was focusing on travel for digital marketing so that helps me to sort of continue doing the same thing so the success of uh, e marketing i is basically because of our specialty because we know what we're doing You know, if you do not understand the vertical you are in, if you do not understand what matters to your 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 customers and their customers, because we are B two B, right? So it, it will be it's very difficult uh, for you to be successful. So one reason why we are successful is we've been always understanding what exactly their problems and how we can help them to solve the solve the problems and work in partnership. Uh, because uh, attitude matters a lot, and you should you should always try to sort of um, see how the partnerships can sort of take your customers to next level. Because then they'll take you with you, take take uh, me with them, right? So uh, that's that's how it had been. And um, I always get this question like any challenges you have faced um, in the doing this. So I think I gave an interview like a couple of weeks before COVID that I I said that I had never faced challenges. So um, I mean, never had faced any challenges in my last thirteen years, but now we face challenges, which is very interesting because um, the vertical we are specializing is going through a bad patch. So, which actually enable us to be more innovative. You know, we've launched about four or five new products within the last two months um, during COVID. You know, if it was without this, uh, without the challenge, I don't think we've done anything. uh in within two months because we 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 tend to sort of uh, take things differently and we are busy with the day to day stuff so but, uh, i'm a great believer of um the challenges definitely take you to next level so which actually have helped us uh in in this situation as well so i would sort of stop here and we can discuss more so uh, you know rajinda i'm one of your biggest fan <laughs> i'm one of your big fan so uh, i have this one question how did you come up with an idea the name e marketing ai so what's the definition of that okay all right so if you ask me what how, what does it sound i can tell you that it's because we will we will be the eyes of e marketing and we will make sure we take you where you want to be right but if you want me to be 100% honest you know it's just that uh one of my other partners manu pre came up with the name okay why don't we call it e marketing i because we had set up something similar before not a, not a not a digital company so that's how the i came into picture so um so since you can't read the name so we have always made the i part a uh, different color or, or e capital or, or upper case or something of that side so we we love the concept and people tend to sort of um 
you know, understand us. And, and then people came to call us EME, uh, you know, so they rebranded us. So although the company name is eMarketing, I, last year we changed the logo to EME because anyway, the industry was calling us that. So it was, it was a good move. And all of our products, we always end with I just want to sort of maintain the uh, identity. There's no big story behind it, but it's just that we wanted a name and um, just came up with it and it just went, went okay. And uh, yeah. yeah. So that's how the entrepreneurship works. Why? Because uh, we don't do the big board meeting to decide a product name instead of wasting the time. So this is how we define. So I'm really, um, I mean, the way that you're progressing your company, the culture that you're building, I'm really grateful for that. Please keep doing it. Great. So uh, coming back, Ruthie, I mean, pronouncing you in a very correct way, Ruthie. Yeah, Ruthie, that's perfect. Okay, perfect. So as usual, Ruthie, please uh, give us a short brief about you and why did you get into the social media? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I know people might be really confused seeing my first name and then my last name. Um, but just to clear things up, I am Sri Lankan. Uh, I was born and raised in Sri Lanka. My dad is Sri Lankan. I just look exactly like my mom, who's from America. So um, I moved uh, to the States uh, nine years ago to go to college and then ended up staying here and finding my passion and living here. And um, yeah, so I really enjoy social media and growing up, you know, in my age group where so many people started joining Facebook and then Instagram and now TikTok and whatever it is, it's always new and always changing. And that's what I really love about it is there's no, you no know, stagnant movement in social media. So, um, I, uh, in college, I, you know, really thought I was going to go into business and that's, that was my focus. I knew I was going to be business, maybe admin, some type of business. Um, when I was younger, um, I grew up in a huge family. So if there were uh, 25 kids in my family. Yes, you heard that right, 25. So huge family. And um, I just remember when we wanted to go on vacation, my parents were like, hey, if you want to go on vacation, you have to figure out a way where you can pay for this vacation. And so um, I am number 23 out of number 25. So I'm one of the babies of the family. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, how can we make this work? And so it was maybe three or five days till the date we were going to go on vacation. And we all came together and decided, okay, we're going to uh, figure out what's the best thing that we can do to sell within this family. And then we decided, okay, that's going to be cooking because Ruthie loves to make donuts. So we'll have Ruthie do donuts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who can do delivery? Who can do word of mouth marketing and so on and so forth. And we split it up and delegated everything to everyone. And that's really where my passion for business came about because within three days we were able to raise enough money for all of us to go on vacation, which was so much fun. And we learned a lot in that time as well. And so, you know, coming into uh, college, you know, of course I knew I wanted to do business. I just didn't know what I wanted to focus my energy on. And so I had a class that I took and it was a marketing class. And in that class, we had to pick a business and, you know, do all the marketing for them. And so through that experience, I really knew that my focus was definitely going to be on marketing. And so I decided to major in marketing. And then after I graduated, I worked with, you know, lots of different companies. But um, what I really enjoyed working with is the real estate uh, community. And so I have a bunch of real estate brokers as my clients. I've worked um, doing real estate for um, actual marketing agencies within real estate offices. So it was like so much to do with marketing and real estate. But then um, recently I started working with Blueprint Technologies. And so uh, very, very different, uh, totally different uh, look at social media marketing. But I've learned so much over the past um, year working with them and doing a lot of tech marketing and really understanding how to bring out that human side in social media. I think you are a good storyteller because <laughs> Looking at uh, Khalid and uh, Rajita, so they're smiling. They're smiling. <laughs> they are like, 
So you had a good start. I mean, I, I'm still I'm still stuck at the at the 25 siblings, uh, you know, portion, and I'm doing some math in my head. So because I noticed just, that because you no, know, it was it's um, a lot of adopted siblings. So my uh, mom did not work to 25 kids. Okay, you're gifted then. <laughs> you're blessed and gifted then. <laughs> Okay, perfect, perfect. So that's, a, uh, that's a fantastic way. And guys, um, why we are digging deep about the people, why they are choosing a specific career. Say an example, when it comes to digital marketing and performance marketing and emotional marketing or even conversion rate optimization. When you look at this, it's inter interconnected. So everything is interconnected. Why we are asking the people why they choose purposely the digital marketing, purposely the social media marketing, because it's all about the passion. So not everyone is good at analytics. Everyone is not good at numbers. So that's the main reason I'm asking them to give a reason. Why are you choosing social media? Why are you specifically choosing the conversion rate optimization? Okay, again, so the uh, sound is done. So I will go with Khalid again. So, uh, Khalid, you know the, the, the conversion rate optimizer and the CRO is one of the most uh, vital uh, area that each and every single uh, digital marketers and the e-commerce business owners, they need to focus on it. But when you look at the particular vertical, uh, most of the e-commerce uh, webmasters, they don't have an awareness about how to integrate the CR goals, how to create the goals, how to measure and scale their SKUs. So can you give us a, a little bit of a brief about the, it's not just a basic, the tools that you're using in order to track the conversion. Sure. So th th there's two aspects to tracking conversions or even running conversion. Let's talk about like you know, running a conversion program. Um, there's a tool side of things, which by the way, I find to be the easier side. And then there's the human side, which is, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've been running the agency now for 15 going on 16 years. That's about 100 times harder <laughs> the, to, to figure out. Uh, in terms of the tools, at the very basic, basic level, you, you need your analytics, correct? Um, whether it's Google Analytics, whether you know, if, if you can go to an, an enterprise side. And people get stuck a lot of time on which tool do I need to use. And I, I tell them, ultimately, what you need is you need to identify, you need a tool that identifies how many visitors your site uh, is getting and how many conversions conversions generating what are the different channels what are the different sources and mediums that are coming to your to your site that's what you need to do so google analytics out of the box a little bit more configuration will give you that that data in addition to that you probably need a few other things you need a tool that will be able to record session replays uh, so it will record visitors that they're coming through the website a tool that will allow you to create heat maps uh, on your site uh, so you're able to track how where visitors are clicking, how further down the page that they're navigating or uh, scrolling through. You need a tool that allows you to track polling, uh, to, to conduct polling, where you're asking your visitors questions. Uh, what brought you to our website? What's stopping you from converting? For those who converted, what persuaded you to convert? So some online polling. So that's kind of a set of tools that... We, we, we should have as CROs. But let me go to the other part, which is the human elements, having the right mindset to be able to run those tools. Because every business nowadays has access to those tools. They don't cost a whole lot of money. For a small website, you're talking about probably anywhere between 20 to $100 and you got those tools up. But having the ability to look at the data, look at because the data just tells you the what. It doesn't tell you the why. Why are visitors clicking here? Why are they navigating? Why are they leaving your website? That's a lot harder. And to build that skill set, yesterday I was talking to, to a friend and he told me, he's like, oh, you've hired people. He's like, do you think that we can teach them CRO? And I told him, for every 10 people that I hire, there are two people that I'm able to train. And it takes me about three years to train them to the point where I'm like, okay, well, they're getting closer to the senior level uh, and they're on the right track. Um, marketers, you know, we always talk about focus on the customers. Okay, focus on the customers. But what does that mean? You know, we, we've just repeated this so many times in conferences and books and webinars. And uh, I was listening to an ad uh, for a law office uh, on, uh, on the radio and they said, we put customers first. And I'm like, okay, so here's the lawyer. Tell me, put customers first. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. You know, are you going to 
forgive them from paying? Are you going to do like what you're supposed to? What does it mean to focus on the customer? And I think that's where most marketers struggle. You take this theoretical concept, which is very powerful. How do you actually translate that on your site? Um, it's, it's a lot more challenging than we, we typically say or, or think. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of a long answer. <laughs> that's what happens when you ask me questions about conversion optimization. So. Of course, of course, of course. So uh, there's a wise word uh, when it comes to marketing. Um, don't sell, make loyal customers. So I love that. Yep, exactly. Build, build the brand, correct? Uh, build the tribe um, and then understand what makes that drive click, not click online, but click actually like mentally, correct? Where it's like, oh, light bulb is going on. And, and then so, uh, Yeah, that's a misconception. Say an example, when we are selling a product, uh, the marketers, they are thinking like, that's the, that is the end when they are issuing a receipt. But in my opinion, I think most of you will agree. My opinion, this is where your business is getting started. When you are issuing the receipt, which means the customer legally is getting connected based on your product, based on the experience that you're delivering, is going to talk with others. Say an example, I'm gonna buy a car from your company. So most of my colleagues, most of my followers, they're gonna ask me where did you bought this car and what kind of brand? Can you give me a justification about it? So which means the way that you are delivering the product and the way that, that you're onboarding me will make an impact where I'm gonna give a negative or positive impact about your brand. So that's all about the experience that you shared with us. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. So uh, coming back to Rajda, Rajda, I think um, uh, we do have a very common um, way of approaching the digital marketing uh, verticals. Um, so you know that digital marketing is now derived into uh, inbound marketing and the performance marketing and, and going in a way, it, it, in a different ways. So my questions to you, Srajita, how do you see the digital marketing in future? Do you think the people will invest, the brands will invest money on digital marketing? Because it's getting saturated, it's getting diversified, like a omnichannel, performance, experience, and emotional marketing. There are type of marketing is coming like a mushrooms. But if you plug it together, of course, there are digital marketing core, but how do you see how it's going to be in future. Okay. Yeah. So what I'll just talk about the historical trends a bit and then move into the future, right? So uh, for example, if I, if I go back to um, the early days of my career, um, I mean, people are unknown of digital marketing, right? And, and they really don't understand things. But with the growth of infrastructure, the new generation, and uh, penetration of mobile phones and everybody wants the convenience. So um, now we get more and more people coming into, into uh, getting connected to uh, internet and they want the convenience, right? So what I've seen uh, from the past versus now, um, the companies have invested in, in digital marketing resources and companies are thinking of digital marketing budgets. For example, if you take uh, Sri Lanka, uh, um, five years ago, six years ago, there are no digital marketing advertising budgets. You have a marketing budget, and wow. then you know, you know some the IT manager is trying to get something because IT manager was the digital marketing expert, right? You know because yes. that's the only person who understood, you know, um, what it, what is it, right? Uh, could be five or could be seven years ago, right? So then every dollar you spent on digital marketing was questioned, like why you want to do it. But no one questioned why you want to put a full page ad on a Sunday newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have no freaking idea how many people would see it and what action that they would take and what kind of engagement you have. Uh, but slowly, um, things move, uh, things, things change and uh, people start questioning, okay, what's going to happen to my investment? But I think, uh, you know, even still now, the countries like Sri Lanka, uh, I'm sure the, the, the senior management or very uh, you know, high level people would still question why you want to spend $10,000 in a one month campaign, uh, but no questions will be asked why you want to run an advertisement on a, on a Sunday newspaper or three Sunday newspapers spending about 2 million rupees, um, which is it's pretty much the um, you know, same amount when it comes to dollars. So uh, people would still question. So the, the reason why 
um, you know, it happens is uh, people still do not see the benefit. Uh, but, um, and how we marketed uh, uh, digital uh, to most of the corporates at the early stages that you can track things, you know, you can optimize, you know, um, like Carly optimizing the conversions. So, um, and I'm still doing it, but that has a bit of a disadvantage now because people tend to believe a digital can only drive conversions. You know, the industry I'm in, you know, and we are a complete conversion driven performance uh, marketing agency. Uh, but uh, people have to understand the, the power of digital when it comes to awareness and branding, you know, which sometimes some industries like um, in, are, are, are slow to understand because they always want to see a conversion number or a revenue figure against the digital marketing dollar that you spend, which has to change. Um, in, in, in terms of the future, I don't think um, digital will lose anything for the next five to 10 years because you will see a lot of growth in this because this um, people who understand digital are uh, um, getting bigger and bigger. There's a lot of education programs, you know, uh, people start learning. And then the senior management uh, is changing or the people who are understanding is becoming the senior management uh, because the new generation is taking over the companies. Uh, there's uh, people who understand the businesses, understand the power of digital are becoming um, uh, or going into the boardrooms. So I think um, the future for digital is going to be fabulous, um, especially the, the, the current situation, the COVID uh, situation actually gave a boost to digital because everybody wants to go online and everybody wants to sort of, um, you know, do things digitally. You know, you will not have the same bubble that it created, but you, it will come down slowly, but it will surely, uh, surely, um, take things uh, forward. So I think the future of digital is going to be, you know, uh, fabulous and everybody wants to do more things digital, uh, not just in advertising, but in terms of, you know, transformation of uh, companies digitally. And of course, marketing will play a huge role as well. So I think the future is going to be great, but it's, it's a matter of how uh, the agencies and the experts uh, manage the situation, you know, being transparent, being honest and, and educating people uh, to make sure that they, they are not getting scared of uh, uh, things. Because if, if, uh, if an agency doesn't sort of be honest, you know, take the client in the wrong path, you know, that corporate or the company or, or the person will, will, will think 10 times before investing, you know, money in, 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 um, in, in, uh, in digital marketing, right? So it's the responsibility of the industry, the digital marketers, to make sure that you manage the situation properly and, and then take it to next level. But in terms of the opportunities, in terms of the growth opportunities, in terms of whether there'll be more budgets, budgets coming into digital, of course there will be. And um, it's just a matter of how, how, uh, how we manage it and how we actually show the, the, the benefit of it to, uh, to, to, to the corporates and the industries and different verticals. You're right, Rajita, because I see um, due to the, the current situation, all the, the offline business, the brick and mortar business, they are transforming. They're completely transforming. Even though they don't like it, they like it or not, they have to transform. That kind of situations are happening now. So- uh, Let me give you one example, Sharan, you know, since we talk about it. Um, yep. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat your question again? Yeah. Just, I'll, I'll just give you one example of what happened during, yeah, yeah, during the COVID situation, right? So then um, uh, we wanted to help uh, the government during the situation, like how we can sort of, uh, you know, contribute, you know, with, with our skills. So we launched our website called you know, Sri Lanka Stay Safe. And then we wanted to work with anybody who needs our help. So we helped um, the Milko, the Highland, uh, the company to go online. We launched a website. Uh, and they got 8,000 plus orders in, in five hours. People wanted to order milk, butter, and yogurt. Can you believe it? I heard about that news. So, so you guys are behind. Uh, yeah. So it's just, okay. I mean, we didn't do any, any, any marketing as such, just that the need of mm. the hour. Right? So the uh, they started to deliver and there's so much you know, pressure to them, but mm. that created a new market. So uh, people sort of, I mean, this, it's not something you want to order online. It's something you pick it up on grocery store, right? But now there's a market, you know, and if, if these companies uh, actually manage it, they can 
reduce the distribution costs and, and the customers will have convenience of doing things. So you will not have 8,000 orders a day now, but you will definitely have, you know, you know a, a lot more than what you used to have, like the supermarkets. So I think it's, a, it's all about managing the situations. So, yeah. Understood. So uh, not only the biggest companies, even the salons and spas, they are, ha they are transforming their business with a Q basis. So you can, of course, in Colombo, there are it's the business model already exists the booking system. But in the rural area, especially from my city, Baumia, the local salons are developing an application to make a queue, the booking. So you have to bring the token, or you need to get an SMS token to enter the store. So likewise, even the small business are transforming. Okay, coming back to the topic. Uh, Khalid and Rajda, I would really appreciate if you guys if you guys can share your email or contact detail through the chat box where people can reach out if they have any questions. So coming back to Rothir, uh, I think um, when it comes to e-commerce and uh, uh, the conversion and also the promoting the business landing pages through the social media, the people are having uh, the most of the people, most of the, the, the freelancers. And the people who are coming into the market doesn't have a proper awareness about how to promote their landing pages and product pages through the social media. So what you, what's your uh, uh, advice is for these people? Whether we want to create a typical advertisement like a pixel and uh, Facebook ads, or are you suggesting to go ahead with a storytelling, a compelling way of creating contents? So what's your advice for that? Yeah, um, so... It honestly depends on the business for me. Uh, whenever I talk to clients, like, you know, I've had clients who have owned food trucks. I have had clients who are real estate brokers and then clients in the finance industry. So it really depends on where your customers are going to be and focusing all your energy on that. Um, let's say all of your clients are going to be on um, Instagram all the time and you just have seen that trend of, um, you know, checking your analytics, making sure that you have a ton of traction on that particular platform, and then definitely creating ads for that. Um, something that's, you know, not very new, but definitely still up and coming is the influencer marketing. Um, and, you know, so many people, they think that tapping into influencer marketing can be expensive or um, not super effective, but if used wisely, this can be a huge opportunity. Um, I mean, just think about it, just even like you guys were talking about the whole COVID situation, right? Um, when you are looking now, at least in my area, there's all the restaurants are open only for takeout. Um, no one's able to go in. It's either delivery or takeout and not many people are out and about. So it's very closed off. Um, and I don't want to cook three meals every day. I love cooking, but three meals a day, every day is just a little too much. And so sometimes, you know, I just want to order something or go out and pick something and go for a walk. And the first thing I do is check out my social media pages. Why? It's because all these companies are now promoting all of their products and services on there, right? They know that people have more time on their hands, especially right now, to be on these platforms. And so that's the first thing I do is check out the pages and then they say, you know, oh, these are what we're cooking for this week or um, these are the specials we're having. And literally 90% of the time, what I choose to eat is because of my social media. And so using these tactics of finding out where your clients are, um, now e-commerce, obviously, um, if it's something, you know, selling big products or services, LinkedIn is going to be your way. Um, what I've noticed is creating LinkedIn um, ad forms are really great tactic as well um, because you know, you're giving someone something in order to get their information. Um, a lot of times people will, you know, if it's an ebook about the topic your business really um, excels at, maybe it's with data virtualization that you know you do and you found something that's really cool that people can really use to optimize their own business or um, that's a you know b2b but if it's a b2c you can definitely change that around and giving them something to get something is super important so um yeah focusing on influencer marketing because it's big in the social media industry um doing facebook ads because 
we all know Facebook has been around for so long that they have so much information about people that's kind of creepy sometimes how much you can target your ads but you know take advantage of that and you know post ads and um, use those metrics after you've created them to see what worked what didn't um, create a B testing to see what performs better and then use that going forward perfect thank you so much for uh, giving an information about how the current social media situation is happening and what are the uh, what are the opportunities that we have right now um, so meantime for the participants guys if you have any questions please make sure post your questions in the comment box below and uh, make sure your uh, your question is very uh, specific like I said before earlier, just make sure for one um, speaker, uh, because we have to give a chance for others, nothing else. I don't have any personal issue with you guys. Um, in order to make it more, uh, the conversation more interesting, um, question from uh, Khalid, you know the e-commerce business websites, the e-commerce uh, the portals are now getting in a different ways. It's like earlier we are using the WordPress and the Magento, Shopify, and all these platforms. But now, so the typical platform, typical CMSs are getting disrupted because the way the digital marketers and the companies are producing new and new CMSs, which is pre-built in SEO, pre-built in digital market effectors, pre-built in social media, as well as pre-built in conversion rate optimizer. How do you see? How do you see whether it's going to make us easy to sell and scale our product? Or still, do we need to integrate any of the new tools? If you say, if there are some tools that we need to integrate, can you give us an advice about it? I think I asked you three questions. <laughs> yes, I was gonna say that's a, a very loaded question, but this is an important question. So the tools will continue to de develop. Uh, develop. Um, it's funny when I look nowadays at, for example, Shopify. Uh, Shopify, you can get a Shopify store up and running, and thus even talk about Shop Shopify Plus. What does that cost? Like, you know, $2,000 a year. This is, by the way, better than the site that cost Mo Motorola $35 million 15 years ago. So that just tells you about the development of the space. But here, here's the thing that I really want to emphasize. And, and we as marketers, by the way, we get stuck in this. And I get stuck in this. Oh my God, I was just thinking about this. We get stuck on the tools a lot more. I'll give you a very practical example of me getting stuck. So we're releasing a CRO Academy. Um, you know, we, we, we have a course that we've taught all over the place and we're like, oh, we're stuck. We can't really be teaching it at conferences all across the globe. Let's go ahead and record. What do I do? Then you should see this over here. There's a studio behind me with cameras and like, you know, teleprompter and the lights and like, you know, the paint. I got stuck on the tools. It took us almost like a month and a half to produce. And then we released the course and we're happy with the course. But then I was talking to a friend earlier today and he was showing me a Facebook advertising course. And I was telling him, I'm like, okay, well, I'm like, I was very proud of my course. I'm like, we're selling it. I'm like, I'm debating whether it's too expensive or not. We're selling it for $2.99. And he's like, oh, that Facebook advertising course, which does not have the same tools. I know that they did not spend as much time as we did. And they did not invest as much in terms of the equipment. However, the content was, is absolutely amazing. He's like, oh, I bought it for $2,000. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow. You know, that was a very hard lesson in my face because I always talk about ignore the tools focus on what's important and yet I fall into the same the same trap here here's the other thing that you want to think about and, and we see this by the way consistently what works for one website does not work for another website I'll give you a practical yeah. example uh, throughout my talks for the last 10 years I've always said I don't understand why e-commerce companies have an add to cart button on the category pages that's kind of a standard Khalid. Like, you know, if you listen to Khalid, he always says that. I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> no one ever adds an item okay. from the category page. That's what I said. Then I get this client that signs up uh, with us, and they're a large enterprise client. And we're setting up the funnels. And I just see, like, you know, on the people are navigating from the category page to the cart page. And I'm like, oh, there's a problem with the, you know, there's a problem with the analytics and the way it's set up. And I have a team that's looking at it and they're like, no, there isn't a problem. I'm like, no, 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 there is a problem. I will watch the videos and I will show you guys that there is a problem. 
I watched the videos. People are actually clicking on the add to cart from the category page. And I actually made a post on LinkedIn where I said, guys, you know, never say never. Um, I was so confident and arrogant and visitors always humble you, correct? So yes, the tools are there. The platforms were always enhanced and that makes our life easier. But you know what? What that does, it removes the very first layer that we have to focus on as marketers. Uh, I would say whenever you're trying to optimize for the best experience, there's different layers. The first layer is the bugs. No one wants to order from a buggy website. It's a horrendous experience. Um, the second layer is usability. If I click on an item, you know, and I expect something to show up, I, I need that to happen. Those are easy things. Now, persuasion, and actually how do you persuade me to, to convert is a lot harder. And here's the difference between them, and I'll stop at this. The difference is in the mindset of the visitor between, oh, I can buy from this site. That's one attitude. The second attitude, I want to buy from this website. Second attitude. Third attitude is I must buy from this website. You see, we went from I can buy to I must buy. That, that transformation is, is, is huge. Khalid, can you repeat again what you said, the three things that you mentioned? Because the audience, yeah. no. Uh, sure. So the, the three, three different things in the mindset of the visitor that you want to optimize for, I can buy from the site, which is, you know, you should have that. The second level is, is when the visitor thinks I want to buy from this site. And the third level is I must buy from this website. Okay. Extremely powerful. You get to this, I must buy from this website and you become to an, an Amazon. Guess what's Amazon conversion rate? Amazon prime conversion rate is a 72%. Wow, you know, 72% conversion rate for every 100 people, 72 of them place an order. That's extremely powerful. Yes. So see, Rajita, there's a pattern that we can uh, learn. Convince and convert. <laughs> exactly. The convince. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So yeah. what's happening in the typical shopping cart, what I observed, I mean, from my personal um, experience, when someone coming to the, the onboarding process, the customer life journey, customer onboarding journey, while it's happening, they are adding the product in the cart. And while they added the product in the cart, we are, the companies are adding entirely different products, which means it's creating a distraction to go back. So they're confusing, the cart is confusing. So when the people, when the customers reach into the cart, we need to make sure they are directly diving into the shopping cart or the payment gateway page rather than confusing them. So if you look at the Amazon and the, the, the most reputed uh, e-commerce platform, this is how they design their product landing and skews pages. So, but still uh, we are relying on the Magento and WordPress with WooCommerce. So <laughs> come on. I mean, this is the ultimate purpose, uh, I call it, that we are trying to educate the people because we don't want to complain because our people, they have the skill and talent, only thing that they need an awareness and they need the knowledge from people like you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think, by the way, like, you know, this is one of the very first things that any, if you're a freelancer, you should do this. If you're an e-commerce website owner, you should do this. Don't go through your website because you're used to it, correct? You see it, you get used to it after a little while and you become immune to the problems. Uh, you either ask your mom to place an order. It's like, hey, we, uh, we sell this item and tell, tell her about an item that you sell on your website. Can you go ahead and find it on our and just watch her? Or what I do is I ask my son who's 12 years old to go through the process. And I always call this the crying game, as in tears come down your, your face, because you're like, why on earth are they doing this? Why, where are you clicking? You know, why aren't you, like the items in front of your face, but they're not seeing it. Uh, and you, you see that confusion on their face and it's like, you know, why are they confused? And, and it's funny because sometimes we design things and I look at, I'm like, why are visitors acting this way? Uh, and, uh, we were conducting a study for, for eBay to show how people buy uh, the iPhone 11s. Really straightforward, we bring a whole bunch of people, we're watching them. And the guy is like, you know, doing a search. He's, he's a technical guy, we just brought him from outside. And I'm like, oh, can you buy on an iPhone 11? So he goes on eBay and the search functionality was broken, that's what we were testing. The guy gets frustrated, typical user. He goes on Google, searches eBay.com, iPhone 11. The Amazon team, the SEO team is very powerful. So they show a result for Amazon. He clicks on Amazon. He's going through the checkout process for Amazon. Remember, we're doing the usability tests for eBay. And I'm sitting there watching him and I'm like, 
what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm placing the order for the iPhone 11. I told him, you're on the wrong side. He's like, oh, really? And I always tell, I'm like, every VP of marketing, every CMO should be, every site owner should be freaked out because it was that easy for somebody to place an order on a competing website. So. See, uh, on the website, we are using heat map to understand what's happening, where they're hovering. But what you say is something really next level. You are, you are just simply putting your son and looking at his face to get an expression how he's going through that order process. I think you're on the next level. <laughs> Thank you so much for the, the detailed brief about it. Uh, so uh, for the Rajita, um, regarding the digital marketing uh, situations, um, the, the vertical that we are getting into, so advices, especially for the travel and tourism, because I have a very specific request from our group uh, from the digital on panel, especially they are asking a question that related to the travel and tourism in Sri Lanka. So what's your advice for that? What are the things that need to focus when it comes to post COVID-19? I mean, can you just give us three guidelines? Okay, uh, but I just want to, I really want to add something what Khalid said because um, uh, he mentioned that, you know, when you look for one product and you try to push, I think you or Kali said, like, you know, people don't want to, people get confused and distracted, right? Uh, I'll start with that and I'll connect that with the, the hotel examples that we, we, we see all the time. What happens is when you're too greedy for business, you lose everything you have. So, for example, you know, in, in hotel booking engines, you know, if you take the hotels, um, the most uh, profitable way for them to generate revenue is from their own brand website, right? Because you don't pay a commission to OTAs and you don't have to give lower rates to uh, the third party travel agents. So the best way to get revenue is, uh, is using your brand website. So what happens is um, uh, when, when, when you want to get bookings, you try to sell everything else as well. You just don't want just the, not just the room booking, but you want to sell the excursion, you want to sell the spa, you want to sell the wine bottle during the process of, of someone making a booking, right? So what happens is, so I want to make a booking, so I just go and select the room, and before I complete, they put another screen in between and say, okay, do you want this? Do you want the car? Do you want that? Right? And I was like, okay, why not? I try to add it, and then it looks expensive, right? But you go to OTA. Uh, and then they just sell the room and I just finish it with three, three clicks, right? So um, my advice is that if you, if you want to be successful, look at booking.com uh, because they do things right. Not a, not a fancy, nice website, but the process is very, very easy. Uh, so what happens is what, I'm, what I gather from that is if you confuse the customer with too many choices, you eventually lose them, especially mm -hmm. in an online world because you don't have much time Everybody is making quick decisions. So don't confuse the customer. Just be clear on your offering and make sure that uh, you, you, you get it absolutely right. You know, you want to sell a room, sell the room first. And you want to upsell, do it later. Not in between, right? So that, that's one thing we can look at. So if you want me to add anything on post-COVID for travel and hospitality, right? The first thing you need to do right is um, to get your platforms right. Right? If it's a hotel uh, or if it's a travel company, you know, get your platform right. I mean, make sure your website looks good. Now you have all the time in the world to look at the content, uh, you know, look at um, the look and feel of it, and make sure you have necessary tools integrated to it. Right? That's number one, get, get the platform right. Number two, look at the statistics uh, or, or your analytics platforms and making sure that you understand um, you know what customers do on the website because if you take hotel websites locally and internationally we work with over a thousand hotels around in, in the region uh, maybe most of the customers like you know when we when they come to us the first thing we do is we sit and discuss about the analytics and making sure that their analytics is implemented properly you know they, they can track the bookings they have the event tracking they have the, the funnel and everything is properly done to so make sure that you have your analytics set up properly, right? So that's the second thing. Because if you talk to 20 hotels, right, I'm, I'm sure that 15 hotels do not have analytics properly. Or if they ask, do you have analytics? Everybody will say yes. But have you done it properly? Everybody will say yes. But look at it, it's not done properly. So you need to make sure you get that right. Because um, you need to make sure that 
every every visitor comes into the website. I think Scarlett, uh, especially the, that you optimize the conversion. Don't don't try to attract more people to your site, but get 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 uh, get the best from your existing clientele. Okay. So uh, what what hotels should do is get the platform right, get the analytics right, and make sure that you do your homework. You know, on on social media platforms. Uh, will play a huge role in, in the current situation um, because people spend a lot of time on Facebook and social platforms. So tell them how beautiful is your destination. You know, tell them you know what actions you've taken. You know, tell, talk about the the, the the environment, the excursions, the locations, your hotel uh, and experiences. Do videos. Show them what you are doing to sort of um, you know take take things to the next level when when hotels are open, right? Um, and be ready with uh, with um, your digital marketing strategies, uh, because what happens is um, everybody loves social media. You know, I know that's great. That's a very upper funnel when it comes to hotels. You know, hardly people would see your ad on social media and and make a reservation. That percentage is small, but it's becoming uh, bigger and bigger now. But your revenue is with search. Ruthie might not uh, like what I'm going to say, but it's, you know, social media definitely helps. It's, it's like a great influencer. But if you look at who brings revenue on a brand website, the search brings about 70% to 80% of your total online uh, bookings and revenue, right? So you need to make sure that you are ready with, with your strategy for search, right? But with this situation, social media is playing a bigger role as well. Make sure that you, you, you post enough things on it, but it's very, very upper funnel. You know, it's, it's not the people who are willing to book now, but it's the people who are planning a planning stage. But when people are closer to make a reservation, when people are closer to make a decision on where to go, which, this, uh, which hotel to stay and which airline to fly, you know, they, they, they spend a lot of time on search. So make sure that you get your SEO right. You know, um, and you optimize for right keywords. Um, you know, when people look for, because people are very, very specific. You know, they would say, uh, you know, hotel name booking dot com. You know, sometimes you know, book online your brand term. What happens is what you know, you look for someone look for your brand term, end up booking on an intermediary, or the, you drive them to an intermediary because your presence is not so great, um, and then they'll end up your company uh, booking your company to hotel. You know, um, because they see a lot of deals and offers, right? And people, uh, especially when it comes to travel or when it comes to e-commerce, they, they don't have patience. They want to see a lot of things quickly and, and make the decision uh, very, very fast. Um, even if they take time to make a decision, they will switch between so many things, you know? What we know is uh, when it comes to travel, they will visit at least 30 to 40 sites before they make a decision. It can be review site, can be travel site, can be hotel sites, can be OTA sites. It's about destination websites. So you need to make sure that your strategy connects all, all the dots. Not just do search, but make sure you have some presence in social media. You do your email marketing campaigns right and, and wherever they go. Because uh, in, a, in a hotel or, or a brand hotel brand site or a travel company uh, a conversion, uh, what we see is the, re, uh, the revisitors brings about 70% of the revenue. That means someone who visits your website for the first time you know, would be 70% of the traffic, but brings about 30% of your revenue. Who brings the revenue uh, is people who are coming back into your website, making sure you, you invest on remarketing campaigns, retargeting campaigns, on, on bo both uh, search platforms and display platforms, and especially on social media platforms as well. Because um, people want to see more things, but they, are, they, they need to be reminded about what, you, what your offering is. And be innovative uh, in, in, in what you do. For example, give them flexibility in cancellation policies and they should be able to cancel the bookings anytime. And we recently launched a, a voucher system uh, with theme resorts. Uh, you know, it, it, so being very flexible. You buy your, buy, uh, your package now, uh, the hotel room nights now, and you have uh, six months or a year to decide when you want to travel. You know, you know uh, give that kind of flexibility to your uh, yeah. uh, because it's all about that. Um, and if you talk, if you just talk about it, like, you know, your customer so service, how fast you get back to them and how flexible you can be, uh, will, will decide how successful you will be. 
in, in post-COVID situation, not just in travel, but in any business. Good, good. So um, I still uh, remember that what I did uh, for a customer, it's not uh, about me and what I did. For a travel website, uh, like a, a small hotel, which is in Jaffna, they have a static website, not a static CMS uh, with WordPress. We did a, an advanced implementation, which no any other Sri Lankan hotels are doing it. Even though what the Sri Lankan hotels, they, what they do, they simply integrate with booking engines, which is already exist. So what we did, because they don't have huge budgets. So what we did, we just uh, tested the thing that what we learned from the Russell Brunson, .com secrets. So what we did simply integrated the upsell, gross sell, and audio, all the trip funnels for the hotels. So initially they sold a normal room for just less than $15. Once the customer placed an order, reservation, they are displaying the upgrade. Can you upgrade? Would you like to upgrade the balcony room, adding another five dollar? Okay, once they added, once they clicked on it, they're giving, take this three full board, we will give you 70% discount. So eventually, the end of the day, they are getting exactly what they wanted. So in my opinion, the digital marketing, if you put together everything, the digital marketing and the inbound marketing, everything, finally we can see the emotional is getting played. The emotional marketing is the front. So because the same amount, if you're going to display on the front end, the store front end, customers are not ready to buy because they are thinking like, this is the package, maybe I can compare from other sites. But the same amount, they are giving back once the card is going to get in. But the journey that they are making, the customer journey, the way that they are interacting with the shopping cart, exactly it's making a good conversion. So, I mean, we are getting exactly what they need, but giving it different options. Coming back to Roti, Guys, and meantime, if you have any questions, uh, please make sure post in the comment box. So we're gonna start the um, the question and answer within three minutes from now. So Ruthi, I think um, it's better if you can tell us a, a short brief about what are the things that we want to avoid in social media and what are the things that you are recommending to do it in social media when it comes to specifically e-commerce businesses. Yeah, um, so, I think first things first, what you want to do is make sure you're ha you have a purpose for being on the platform. So a lot of times, you know, there's so many options of social media platforms that you can be on, but the question really is, should you be on that? And um, really focusing all of your efforts on to the ones that are going to bring you the most amount of revenue and focusing on what uh, platforms has the most amount of your customers. And so once you have that focused, um, you don't, you're not putting your time and energy into things that are not going to bring anything into your business. So that's the first one. Um, second one is always, you know, using good photography and using great captions. Now photography, you might think that it, you know, seems like a small aspect of it, but honestly, it can bring so much more attention to your post when you have great photography um, and very creative, cool captioning um, and make sure you are proofreading everything because you don't want to seem unprofessional when you post something out there. You want to make sure that you are on top of your game where people see you. They see, oh, wow, this is a really cool post. Let me look more into their company. Um, and then, you know, follow other brands and companies that you really like, um, because that's where you can get inspiration from. Now I'm not saying copy anything, but it's great to get inspiration, whether, you know, you just take a couple uh, minutes or maybe an hour a day to focus on, okay, what is out there in the market? What is my competition doing that I need to level up and step my game up? Um, and then engaging with your audience is always a big thing that sometimes businesses and usually small businesses um, lack because um, let's say you have um, you know a bunch of posts that you've put up and you don't have a marketing person or a social media manager and you're the one posting everything and then you you think posting and then you know you're on to the next project um, 
couple people comment on there and asking questions about your products or your services and dead silence. And you just go on to post the next stuff the next week. That's not doing anything for your company. It almost only frustrates all of the people looking at your post because then they're like, well, I posted a caption. I tried to engage. I tried to purchase a product, but nobody actually reached out to me. So engage with your customers. Even if um, you are engaging with people on their posts who are not even connected with you, that's a way that you can try and leverage their support and um, have them purchase your products. A um, couple things that I would focus on not doing, again, um, if you are not comfortable with social media, hire someone. If you're not a professional at it, don't do it yourself or try and learn it. Um, you know, I understand not everyone has the funds to go ahead with it, but there's so many free learning tools. Um, I mean, even I do webinars for people on social media and webinars like this, they are all so helpful that you can learn bits and pieces, but until you're up to that level, hire someone who knows what they're doing because otherwise your brand is just going to look stale. And sometimes what you have in mind for social media marketing is not exactly what attracts other people and your customers. Um, and don't, this is a huge one, which should be pretty obvious, but don't lie or mislead people. Um, that's like the worst thing is when you see an ad on Facebook for, um, let's say, so recently my husband and I were looking at buying a new mattress and I was looking at all of these companies online and I was then bombarded with so many at mattress, um, advertisements and I'll, I used to see this one ad and I think it was for Nectar is the company and it was the ad was saying $399 worth of free products. So I'm like, okay, well that seems pretty cool. Let me look. And I click on that and then go into it. And it's kind of misleading because you have to buy so much in order to get that. And it's almost a thousand dollars of a mattress to get like, and they're saying sheets and pillows is what you're going to get. You know, it's kind of misleading. Um, sure. It might work for some people, but in my case it didn't work. So think about, really advertising and um, focusing on what your company can offer, not focusing on trying to trick someone into come to your website. Because after all, you want to earn their trust and you want to make sure that you are you know, portraying your company in the best form. And if you're going to lie or mislead, that's just going to be upsetting for everyone, um, for you, because you're not going to get the business and for them, because they are, you know, they were excited about something. That's why they clicked through and then they're upset because they aren't getting exactly what the ad claimed it would be. Um, and then this one, you know, the next one I want to talk about is replying to comments. Now I talked about engagement, but replying to comments that are negative, um, put a plan in place for any type of, let's say negative comments. So in e-commerce, someone's not going to like your products. That's, that's inevitable, right? Someone is not going to like it. They're going to find something that's wrong. Um, whether it's true or not, it's going to happen. Now, when they socially vocalize it, that's huge because that's a big detriment to your brand. But how you react to that is going to set your company apart from um, a bad company and a great company. So learn how to creatively respond to them and maybe it's having a conversation with your marketing uh, manager or your social media manager and talking about, okay, if someone replies like this, let's have some type of verbiage set, set in place where you can use that to respond to them. Of course, you'll you know, edit here and there, but having that small um, two lines that allows you to uh, re respond back to a negative argument or comment that might calm them down. And um, you know, I've seen two very, very different spectrums. And a lot of times, unfortunately, it's with small businesses that we have that, this issue. So small businesses who see some, some uh, negative comments about them, they really, uh, if they're taking, if they're posting all of these uh, stuff on their own and not having someone professional do it, and if they see something that's you know, negative about their company, they take it to heart. And they feel it's an attack on them and 
um, not not specifically their business. And so they respond in a very negative way and say, you know, well, you should not come to this business if you didn't like it, or you shouldn't have purchased it if you weren't expecting this, and so on and so forth. And um, large companies is something that you can really learn from how they respond to this. Um, I've seen some great ones who are like, I'm so sorry that you had this issue. We want to make sure that you have the best experience. Please contact us and we'll be sure to make sure um, you have the best experience going forward and making it up because then, you know, I've seen comments come back after that and say, Hey, they responded. Um, great customer service. I will be a repeat customer. So those are just a couple tips of the do's and don'ts that I would recommend. There's a quote, um, your most unsatisfied customer can be your loyal customer if you can treat them in a proper way. So we call this as a online reputation management. Um, there's a platform, there's a strategy that we can implement when um, acquiring or turning your negative customer as a loyal customer where he can spread the message and bring more his followers to our sales funnel. Okay, I think it's quite interesting. I think uh, this is the time for the question and answer. Um, I read a book uh, named called um, Leadership in You and Leadership Around You. So which means when you, are, when you become a leader, I'm not claiming myself as a leader, but when you learn about leadership, so that you have to pass that baton to others. With that, I'm going to invite one of my co-hosts, Mr. Um, Venkates, to take it from here to manage the entire question and answer. Venkates, over to you. Thank you, Saranjan. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, speakers. Uh, in fact, it is pretty interesting to hear uh, the views from all of you. I just want to summarize a little before I uh, get to the question Q&A. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in this current situation, there are two sets of people. One uh, are the set of people who will freeze, uh, not knowing what to do in this situation. And the other set of people who expand. Uh, you know, in this, uh, so that they do the branding and wait for the situation to become better. I think that's what was the message from Rajita in terms of spend your time branding so that, you know, when things get better, uh, you, know, you, you will already be in the minds of the people. And coming to Khalid, uh, you know, very beautiful in terms of taking the customer uh, from I, I want to buy it to I must buy it. Uh, that's a journey that, uh, you know, I got from Mr. Khalid. And uh, from uh, Ruthi, uh, I think she touched upon two important points. One is uh, whether it is B2B or B2C, it is uh, P2P. So, you know, use reciprocity as a principle of influence. Give something free so that they become your customers. And then she spoke about authenticity, which is pretty important when it comes to social media and uh, online selling. So I, I think, you know, those were the important takeaways for me uh, from all the three of you. Uh, phenomenal. Thank you so much. Uh, now let's uh, go to the questions. Before that, I'm being a little selfish. Just want to ask Kali the question, uh, or probably it could be Rajita also to answer. Uh, what would be the impact of uh, Facebook uh, shops on Shopify uh, other things? I think this probably is something that has been coming up in all the sessions that you've been attending in the last 10 days. But I just want to hear if there is a strategy that we should tell our customers or to ourselves saying that move from Shopify to Facebook shop or is it good to be there? So the way I think about the Facebook shops, it's, it's going at least at this stage, correct? They're going to go after the small businesses, uh, the businesses that are not on the Shopify. They don't have things set up. They're probably trying to capture some of that market. Um, anybody who had gone through the process of setting up an e-commerce store, establishing a store, uh, knows the headache, correct, of moving from one platform to the next. Uh, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, there is this struggling moment where somebody says, you know what, I've had it. I'm done. Enough is enough. I'm switching. Well, that's only about 2% usually of, of people that you go after, by the way. Whenever you're selling, regardless whether you're B2B or B2C, a customer has to reach that struggling moment to make the switch. Um, and you might educate people, and I think that's what Facebook, of course, they have the, they have the platform. They have the people on the platform. Um, now, would I make the switch and the migration? I was talking to a couple of uh, established brands on the smaller side. You know, they're doing about five, six million dollars annually. Uh, and I love what one of their uh, CEOs said. He said, oh, great. Now I have to think of yet another place for my products to be listed on. And I'm like, no, we're probably going to 
going to hold off uh, for a little while. Um, it's all going to come down to the actual implementation. How do you actually ease people placing an order? Can I just actually view an item and place an order completely without any friction? Would that speed things up? Or do I really have to set up the store fully? Um, I, I think to be kind of a sit and watch at this, at this point. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Khalid. Uh, I have one question from the tribe member uh, that says, what will be the impact of augmented reality on digital marketing and e-commerce? I'll probably split this into two uh, just to keep all the speakers engaged. So, uh, Rajita, can, I mean, can, can you talk about augmented reality impact of AR in e-commerce? And I would uh, love to hear from Ruthi about uh, AR, uh, AR's impact on digital marketing. Uh, can, I, can I interrupt you guys? I mean, I know I know Venki is taking over, but uh, to make it uh, something relevant, uh, Rajita, it would be great if you can take off the digital marketing. Venki, please don't get open that because he's highly related to that. I think Ruthi or Khalid is the ideal people for the, uh, the augmented reality. Venki, please don't get me wrong. <laughs> Focus about the topic. I just want to make sure the the, the guest speakers are not getting up on that. Thank you. So, Rajita, you wanna, you wanna take a yeah, stab yeah. at it? Yeah. You want me to do it? Yeah, please. Okay, sure, sure, okay. Yeah, uh, so what, what I believe is um, all these are tools that would help the overall process of uh, making things easier for your consumer uh, to help in the conversion, right? So I think, these are great tools, the new things are happening. Um, but I don't think everybody should go and embrace every new thing that is coming, um, you know, because it might make your life a little bit too complicated. So my suggestion is like, look at your basics first, get the basics right, and then see what these new things can add value to take it to the next level. It will definitely help you in a way to make the process easier, you know, have an assistance, you know, you feel great about it, but is it going to disturb the, the, the customer in the overall experience? Do you really want someone to be there? You know, all of it. Um, so what my suggestion is look at, get the basics right. Uh, and, uh, and then see how these additional tools uh, can add value to uh, the entire process. Fair enough. So Khalid, do your views? I mean, I think, so, see, this is one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the benefits or side, you know, results of COVID-19. It sped up certain things that we were thinking, oh, it's going to take five to 10 years for us to seriously consider. Uh, one of them is augmented reality, contactless delivery. Um, you know, well, we, we used to talk about uh, order online, pick up in store now as Bopis. Now we like, you know, order online uh, curbside pickup, correct? Like, it changed the mindset uh, because consumer behavior changes. Now, I was talking to, to, to Max Al, he, he runs Conductic, Conductix uh, in New York, an amazing uh, statistic anal statistical analysis company. And, you know, he's like, he's like, I always get these questions about like statistics and A-B testing. He's like, the reality of it, 98% of the people don't even have the basics right. He's like, forget about the complexities. Like, I see this analyst who's asking me and I look at their site and he's like, he's like, you have so many other things broken. He's like, I love that they hire us. He's like, but they have the basics. So really going to, um, to Rashta's point that let's get the basics. Yes, there are companies who have the ability to invest and they should invest, correct? If you're at that level, you definitely should look at augmented reality. But that's, I, I dare say that's probably... 5% of the market's uh, place. The other 95%, you probably want to get, like, you know, there's many other things that you want to check before you get to uh, you get to that point. Okay, fantastic. So there's uh, yet another question that has come up, uh, which is, when is CRO right to use in business? And what are the strategies for an, uh, to implement CRO for an upcoming business? Okay. So uh, uh, here's the thing. Um, CRO in general, the way I, I think of it, about it is four different stages identify problems on your site everybody should do that um, you really need to know what are the usability bugs and even conversion opportunities on your website prioritize those items so you know exactly how you can fix them correct okay i mean uh, typically we, we run a project and we can identify oh anywhere between 50 to 200 300 
uh, issues on a website when it comes to conversion. Well, so you don't have the time or the budget to fix 300 items because each one of them will turn to a project sometimes. You wanna prioritize, so you go through the process of prioritization. The third portion, which many companies struggle with is, well, so I've identified, for example, an issue on my website. Let's say the message or the images, uh, like Kroti mentioned, the images are really not good. And I believe that I can use a much better image, for example, on my homepage. And I'm over oversimplifying it over here. Well, how do I know that this new image that came up with, I like it, you know, and my designer likes it. But how do I know that my visitors will like it? And that's a big question, correct? Um, what you do is you do split testing. So let's say you have 10,000 visitors that come to your website, 5,000 of them will see the old design, 5,000 see the new design, and then you say, okay, let the visitors judge. Those 5,000 that viewed the original design, how many orders did they place? Those 5,000 that you know, viewed the new image that I like, that I think is really amazing, how many orders, and you compare. So this is simple, but now let's get into one complication, and, and most people skip that. In order for you to deploy any type of A-B testing that is meaningful, statistically valid, because that's ultimately what you are doing, you need to have a minimum of about 200 conversions per month. And this is extremely important. Lots of people skip over that. They're like, oh, I only have 30 conversions. I want to do A-B testing. And I tell them, no, you cannot do A-B testing. Because in order for you to arrive, you want to run your A-B test for about four weeks. You don't want it to run longer than that. Anything longer than that, things could happen that pollute your data. Okay, so four weeks. And I'll tell people, in order for you to reach statistical significance within four weeks, you need to have a minimum of 100 conversion for each design you're introducing. So your original design is 100 conversions, and the new design, the new image that you like, needs about 100 conversions. It's kind of this back of the napkin. So at a minimum, you need about 200 conversions. Now, if you're just starting out, most, most websites we talk to, don't have this, those 200 conversions. What they end up doing is they say, oh, well, no, we'll test with 30 conversions or with 40 conversions. And they think, oh, based on my software, I have a winner. And then they like, look, for sure I have a winner. And they take that new image and they put it on the site. And then they look at us and they say, hey, my sales did not increase. Nothing happened after I deployed it. Well, yeah, because the statistics are flawed. So you need to get to the point where you have a minimum of 200 conversions a month to do A-B testing. Now, remember, there's steps in the process. I talked about identifying issues, about prioritizing issues. You can even deploy new designs, but you cannot test them if you do not have enough conversions. Um, for most of our clients, we don't even talk to new businesses unless they've achieved nowadays about 500 conversions to 1,000 conversions a month. If you have less than that, we tell them, listen, figure out your social media, figure out your search, your paid search, drive more visitors to the site, and then we'll talk. Uh, conversions comes, but you need to have the traffic, you need to have the conversions or in order for us to have that conversation. Uh, so it's a long answer, but it's good to, for people to know. No, but I think that's how you need to answer that so that you know it's useful for the people who ask this question. Thank you so much. And uh, this is a brilliant question, which is, uh, what can SaaS companies learn from the e-commerce industry? Um, Rajita, can you take this? What can SaaS companies learn from the e-commerce industry? I think you know any 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 companies can learn from e-commerce because I think what happens in the future is people will not go with um, services or products which needs um, capital expenditure. Yes. So they don't want to invest on setup fees or anything. So the future will be that uh, there's a lot of opportunity um, for. Um, for customers to sort of go ahead with services, service providers or products that which charges in an ongoing basis, right? So that's um, that's a huge opportunity for them uh, because um, even the, the products that we are looking at for the travel industry, uh, what we're looking at is like, you, you don't want people to invest at the beginning because everybody's suffering. So they are looking at, you know, how, uh, how um, the people um, you know, how, how we, they can get them to start using the products and, you know, share um, the, the benefits, you know, in terms of partnerships, because uh, nobody wants to spend a lot of money on investing, building new products now. You know, they really want to sort of start using the products, but they really don't want to, um, you know, invest uh, in, in building from scratch. So there's a lot of opportunity for them uh, in, in the current situation. I'll, I'll add one more thing over here. Uh, maybe it's like something SaaS companies should avoid uh, because lots of e-commerce companies fall into. E-commerce companies fall into the trap of sameness, correct? 
everybody looks the same. Um, I mean, if you think about even the whole philosophy of e-commerce, what do we do? We took the mail order catalog that we used to receive in the mail and we put them online, correct? It's even the same setup, by the way. You flip through the pages, different categories, different images, and, and that's what you have. And that's a huge problem because when you look similar to everybody else, you're commoditized. When you're commoditized, you compete on price. And when you compete on price, it's a horrible competition, correct? Because there will always be the next company that figures out how to offer a lower price. So figure out how you create a, a unique experience. As a SaaS company, figure out how you create a unique, unique experience. It's easy for people to copy your design. It's e even easy for people to copy your, your copy, your web copy. It's difficult for them to copy the experience. So how do I create a unique experience? And by the way, e-commerce companies, especially in the smaller space, I always tell people, I'm like, if you're competing against Amazon, you're offering the same thing. That's a tough competition, man. And we have some of our customers. I mean, eBay, we compete with Amazon and we're always testing, trying to match up with what Amazon does. And it's like, you know, it's a huge battle. However, if you're smaller, guess what? You have the flexibility to move really fast. Uh, you can be very creative. You can do things that the big guys are not gonna be able to do. So you're able, whenever you receive an order, to record a video from your customer service guy and send it to the guy who placed an order. You know, I was like, oh, I get only 1,500 orders. I'm like, well, you know what? Okay, it takes about a minute to record, and you already have about 20 CSR, uh, customer service reps. They can record a video. That's a different experience. You don't expect to get something like that. It's standardized. So things that can really set you apart as an e-commerce or is, even as a SaaS can be very unique. So the rule should be whether it's SaaS or e-commerce, never lose a customer again, correct? Yes, we talk about conversion optimization, CRO, but really it's customer retention optimization. Different CRO as well, but kind of a different mindset. Okay, brilliant. In fact, uh, my, ne my next question is a very fundamental question, but it, this one keeps coming again and again, you know, in uh, whenever we get a new, new tool, you know, but we keep going back to this, but is email marketing effective? Uh, I, I think, you know, this you would have answered some thousand times, but we still want to keep listening to it. Every time there is something else that comes up, we, we believe that, you know, whether this will work or not, but I want to know your view and I would uh, allow the speakers to decide who would want to take it or probably I would want to hear from all the three people in terms of what do you think uh, about email marketing? Is it still effective? Um, Ruthie, you want to go first or? Yeah, yeah. sure. Happy to hop in. Um, yeah. I have seen email marketing be super effective on my end at least. Um, you know, depending on what your, what your product is, um, it's mainly just to get the word out and it's super important, especially right now because everyone, you know, doesn't have the opportunity to be walking around and seeing full on live advertisements as you walk throughout, um, you know, wherever you are in the mall or whatever it is, you have to have that additional, um, advertisement in front of someone else. And, even if someone, you know, the, I think the main thing with email marketing is, again, being intentional with what you're sharing, not oversharing, because you don't want people to unsubscribe. Um, you know, now Outlook and all these other uh, big email uh, platforms have the option of really quickly clicking one button that says unsubscribe and you are out of there forever. And you don't want them to click on that. So be intentional with what you do share. Um, and then make sure your links work. Nothing is more devastating than sending an email with a huge promotion or product that you're sharing and they click on it and it goes to nothing. Um, that's happened to me before and I sent a message to the company. Um, I saw an ad and I really wanted to purchase it and they never even got back to me. And so that was super, super disappointing to me. And so keeping that in mind is important. Brilliant. So, let me let me tell you some some numbers uh, around this. Uh, you want to take that? Please, please. Yeah, so we, we track this very closely for our e-commerce clients, and he, here are the the top converting channels typically that we see. Your direct traffic, um, and I know Google uses direct in in many different ways, but we'll just leave it as very general. So if you go under acquisition, source, and medium, and you look under direct traffic, typically that converts the highest for an e-commerce website because those are people who are familiar with your brand. Mm -hmm. Now, an interesting question that you always want to look at is what is the percentage of my traffic that comes direct? 
Um, if you have a very well established brand, could, it could be anywhere between 50 to 70%. That tells you that people recognize you. They bookmark you, they type the name right away. You know, they're not searching, correct? So that's extremely powerful. If you're just starting out, direct traffic is probably anywhere between 10 to 15 to 20%. So that's always a good measure on how well people know your brand. But that direct traffic typically converts the highest. Um, so that's number one. After that, right? After that comes email. With email, you're actually curating the offers. You're telling people, I have this offer, I have this thing, I'm linking it to the landing page, so you control the experience, correct? You control it a lot more than anything else because you have the offer, you're, send, you're controlling the time that they are gonna, you're gonna be sending the email to. Uh, after that, typically now, now after that, you, you go into either SEO or PPC, um, and there's always a competition. It's really varies from one client to the next. Then after that comes social media, paid social media. Um, now, mind you, our clients have, who have looked at paid social media and said, oh, it doesn't generate results. I'm like, oh man, you know, this is a huge mistake. Not everything that you do in marketing is one-on-one, one-to-one relationship when it comes to revenue. And I'm a conversion guy. I mean, we, we have all these metrics and dashboards. And I tell them, like, I cannot really justify to you why you should be spending. And they don't spend it with us. They spend with other agencies. I tell them, but I know here, here's something I know for a fact, because I've seen this over the last 15 years. You turn off your paid social media and guess what happens? Your sales drop. And they're like, what happened? I thought social media was not generating any sales. Well, guess what? Because somebody saw your ad and they clicked on it and they didn't decide to buy. And then later on, you know, they came through either directly or through an ad or through an email. And you thought to yourself, well, actually the conversion came because of a CEO. No, it came because of that first time they connected with you through paid social. Yeah. And it, it never fails. So you always have to think about this whole picture when it comes to marketing and how you drive, how you drive results. Um, you constantly got to be there. Um, I'll add just a couple of quick things about email. Be human uh, in emails. I was sitting uh, with, with, my, with my daughter and she was looking at an email we were writing. And she's, like, she's like, who speaks like that? You know, we're sending an email, we're a B2B. I don't know, we do. You know, she's like, which land do you guys live in? Uh, and I looked at her, I'm like, in the marketing land. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she said, like, it's like, I don't think humans talk like that. I'm like, I agree. So like, literally yesterday, I messaged our, our copywriter. And I told him, I don't think anybody really talks this way, by the way, the way we were talking. Make it more human, just like how you talk to me. And I told him, look at, like, you know, the engagement for posts that I post on LinkedIn versus my company posts. My posts have, have interaction. People are responding. I look at the company posts and I'm like, I don't know who says the word that we're using. Let's be human. And that's what emails offer you, correct? Be very human. Um, allow people to connect with you and you'll see amazing returns on, on email marketing and also on social media, by the way. More human, more authentic. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there's one question that is directed to Rajita, which says that, uh, is there any option to connect travel agent to TripAdvisor platform? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think there are a, there's a section that people will always sort of comment on uh, related travel products. You can definitely look at it. But there's another platform specifically for travel and tour companies. Um, I mean, if you write to me, I can actually send that. I can't remember what it is right now, but uh, I, can, I can surely get back to you. There's a, there's a platform that, you know, all the travel agencies get listed and get comments and feedback uh, from from the potential markets. Um, I can actually find it out. Um, there's something, but I can't, I can't remember right Please. now. Yeah. But I want to add two things about email marketing. So that is yep. like the most abused online marketing strategy, um, you know, ever. Uh, because um, you do a lot of spamming um, uh, using email, but if you do it right, that would be one of the best, um, best strategies that you can use um, if you use it effectively. Um, but um, the popularity has gone down because there's you see a lot of spam, um, spam email marketing campaigns uh, happening around. Yeah, isn't isn't it amazing how many people are buying email lists right now? Yeah, and emailing yeah. people to say, "Hey, we care about you." I'm like, really? Why are you spamming me? Why on earth? Or, or maybe I've subscribed back in 2010. Uh, you cannot mm -hmm. imagine, like, no, every day in the morning, unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. I'm yeah. like. It's just not creative. And I'm like, leave me alone, man. I haven't heard back, uh, heard from you in 10 years. Now you are emailing me to tell me we're with you during COVID. I'm like, okay. Um, yeah. I have a quick Sorry. question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I had a quick question that had come into me privately. So I don't know if you want me to share that at all. I don't know if it was an accident sent to me yeah, privately. Please. Yeah. So the question that came in 
was I was wondering how you can compete with people like Kim Kardashian and Kylie Jenner. Yeah. Now that's a very tough one. Um, <laughs> But I, I mean, I like the term, you know, if you can't read them, join them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, of course, not every company is going to have $250,000 uh, to pay for one social media post. Um, but that's where micro influencers come into play, right? You sometimes um, people don't even need products. They just want someone to connect with to get their brand out. Um, so for an example, like, my husband and I, we have a blog that we do a lot of our travel stuff on. And um, we went to, so we came to Sri Lanka, I think last, no, two Christmases ago. And we decided to do a couple different trips around uh, to, and we wanted to stay at hotels that we had never stayed at before. Because, you know, growing up, we would always go to the same places and we just wanted to branch out, see what's new. So we reached out to hotels and said, hey, we, can put you in our blog, like, um, are you able to either give us a discount to stay there? Now that didn't work out, which is reasonable, you know, but, um, after which we had put the blog together, we had put an awesome travel video together. Um, we said, Hey, we're going to be posting this and your hotel is mentioned in here. Would you like to do a giveaway? We don't get anything out of it. It's just for you to gain followers and for us to gain followers. And one of the hotels reached out. I don't know if you guys are aware of like Cantaloupe Hotels in Sri Lanka, uh, but they were like, yeah, we'd love to do a giveaway with you. So we didn't get anything except for um, extra followers. And um, the hotel got a ton of traction because of all these people commenting. We had over, I think like 2,500 entries into wow. um, and get a hotel stay. I mean, it was almost nothing for this hotel to give two nights away but now all of this traction toward them and it's all because of a blog that a micro influencer did now i wouldn't even consider myself an influencer but um you know you just you get the point where just keep an eye out on micro influencers in your community or there's a bunch of you know travelers that come from other countries that have done quite a bit of work and are willing to um post something about you, post a photo or post a, a video with your hotel or whatever it is, your products. And all you have to do is reach out. You know, they can say no, but, um, and sometimes they'll reach out to you and just give them a chance because you never know what that um, personal touch can do to bring your brand out. I think the next question is uh, probably in continuation with that or similar to that. How does content marketing impact on small business? Probably to reframe that, what is the impact of content marketing, uh, usage of content marketing for small businesses? Uh, you know, is that good to do? Uh, what are the ways to do that? Uh, Ruthi, can you answer content marketing? Yeah, I'm just trying to get a, a grip of what, because that's a very, very broad term. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, one thing that I always tell small businesses is keep consistent, um, because especially cause you know, small businesses don't have a ton of marketing spend, but what you can do is put together a marketing plan and every, let's say every Monday you put together two hours that you spend on your social media and you decide to plan all of your posts out, do the, you know, graphic design yourself on Canva if you need to, or or hire a graphic designer for you and put together all of these and be consistent with the content that you're posting. Uh, Again, be consistent and also um, make sure that you're promoting stuff that are very valid and um, good for your company to be promoting and not just anything just because you want to get something out. Brilliant, brilliant. I think you also told that you need to be authentic before. So authentic, being authentic and consistent, you know, are the uh, key for content marketing for small business. I'll probably ask one la- one last question from my side. It be a lame question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, funnel uh, builder uh, software that is uh, coming up everywhere. Uh, does small businesses really need a separate website, or can they just manage with the funnel? 
Mm-hmm. Oh man, I, ha- I have to like, you know, I have a different view on this one. So we, we do quite a bit of content marketing. We do quite a bit also of white papers and eBooks and we drive about a hundred to 150,000 visitors to our sites every month, uh, all organically, by the way, people searching for us, searching for like, you know, our eBooks. And one of the things that we've done in the past is lots of the funnel, correct? Like, you know, people coming in, they fill a form and then we put them in a funnel and then we send them emails and we have a sales team that follows up. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing next week is removing all that in author, removing all of it. And we're just going to offer for free because what we found, found out over the years, and people don't like to hear this, you set up the funnel and you're like, oh, I got leads, but really they're not ready. Somebody downloading something is not ready, correct? And when people want to purchase, you know, if you create that experience, you're authentic, you create the brand, guess what? They look you up and they will come back. You just need to make sure that you're consistent about your marketing. Uh, if you're just doing a little bit of marketing now and then disappearing for 12 months, it's like, oh, sales dropped. Now we need to do more marketing <laughs> and what's going on? And then you scramble. Well, guess what? Yes, you're going to be hurting, but it has nothing to do with the fact that you didn't have a funnel. Uh, it has a lot to do with the fact that you did not do marketing consistently because marketing is just a, like a flywheel. Um, it takes a while to move, correct? There is a lot of effort to move it. But the minute it moves and you're consistent about it, guess what? People start recognizing the brand and then they make the decision to come. So um, like I said, it's just a bit different approach and philosophy, but that's, that's at least for us, that, that's what, we, what we're advising clients with right now. Okay. Hi, yeah. I have a question. Uh, this is uh, probably Khalid uh, could uh, answer. Thank you for all of the panelists. You know, it's an awesome uh, session, Rajesh and Ruthi. Uh, CRO seems to be a little bit more expensive game. And for someone to outsource it, uh, so if you don't know what you are getting out of it. So what kind of measurements and KPIs maybe Maybe I don't know whether I should be asking you guys because you get business and then I'm asking from this side. How do we measure in terms of the money we spent? Yeah, I mean, CRO is is very expensive, by the way, uh, of all the different uh, marketing activities. So you can can get away. And let me talk about U.S. prices and then I'll mention like you can get away in the U.S. with hiring a decent SEO company. You know, it's now, now we're not talking about your average, but actually like a good one. Um, probably you'll spend five to $7,000 a month. It sounds expensive, but okay. You can, PPC is about 10% of the spend, minimum of three or 4,000. A good CRO agency uh, in the US is probably at least about twelve to $15,000 a month. Tremendously more expensive. Now the premise of CRO is, oh, I'm going to increase your conversion rates. And I've seen this consistently and I've seen it throughout the years where people come, they do a whole bunch of testing. We're testing, we're testing, we're testing, and theoretically we're increasing conversion rates and somebody comes and says, hey, when we started the project, our conversion rate was at 2% and right now is at 2.1, but your testing has shown me that we've increased conversion, all these tests are winners and we should be at least at 3%. Um, And and the only answer that we have to this, we go through lots of statistical analysis where at the start of the project, what we do is we keep a copy of the old websites. That's kind of a standard in our projects and it's horrendous uh, to do because they keep the copy and it's not indexed and it's on an old domain. And then six months down the line, we tell the client, oh, you know, your conversion rate yes is at 2.1. Guess what? Here's what we're going to do. Now we're going to deploy a side-wide test between your old site and your site. Let's see based on the traffic that you're getting six months down the line right now. And let's compare the sales. Guess what? Your old site is at 1.8% or 1.7% and your new site conversion rate is 2.1. So you really didn't go from 2 to 2.1, you went from 1.7 to 2.1. Now at the same time, if you're gonna invest 10, 12, $15,000 in a month, correct, on CRO. And by the way, CRO, lots of times people say, oh, let's do it for two, three months. I'll tell, tell people, I'm like, if you're gonna do two to three months, save yourself the money. It's just not worth the investment because it takes about two to three months for us to understand even what's going on. Um, you need to make sure that, okay, well, a company, I'm going to be working with them nine to 12 months. Let's say they generate, if, they're, if they know what they're doing, uh, there's lots of good CRO companies. Let's say they generate about 25% uplift in my conversions, anywhere between 15 to 25%. Do the numbers make sense? If I'm spending, let's say, $200,000 with them, 
are they yeah. going to be able to help me? Are they going to be generating half a million dollars? It's not really a good investment if you ask me. <laughs> you know, it's like two X. But if they generate, like you know, if they generate two million dollars and I've invested two hundred thousand, okay, that's a ten X return. Uh, that's probably worth the investment. So I always run the numbers, and I, uh, I was just talking to a company in Saudi Arabia. They they reached out and they said, hey, we're interested. And I told them like, what are your sales? And they're like, we're about a million. I told them, okay, well, you know, let's say we, like, you know, we get really fancy and we do some really amazing work and we take you from a million to a million and a half, that's 500,000. Well, guess what? You invested about $200,000 with us. Is it really worth the investment? I told them if, if it were me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this investment. You're not at the right size, at least for us. You might find like, you know, smaller companies, but at the same time, smaller companies might not be able to generate. Um, I just posted on LinkedIn. On average, we implement 12 A-B tests for our clients in a month. Uh, we're spending about 240 hours of development, pure development, not even analysis, pure development, another 100 hours. So there's massive resources that go into a project. Uh, and that's the reason we're able to generate the 25 and 35 and sometimes 60% uplift in, in revenue. Uh, but do you have that revenue? So it's just a long winded answer, but kind of like, you know, there's just lots of thoughts that go through it because lots of CROs always tell me, it's like, oh, how do I justify the spend? And I always tell them, make sure that you're working with the right client. And so the clients will be happy with you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, we're done with the questions. Uh, I, I mean, uh, there would be a lot more questions, but I think uh, the time uh, is a thing that we need to look for. Uh, thank you, Khaled, uh, Rajita, and Ralti. Uh, you made the group much wiser by sharing your knowledge. Uh, you know, baton back to Mr. Saranya. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, um, um, Venkates. For managing the question answer and my sincere apology for interrupting you uh, because I just want to make sure the question is directed to the highly relevant uh, uh, the panelists. That's all my intention. And for the participants, guys, our panelists, they will be available in our very exclusive group that we have in our LinkedIn truck. And uh, so I will get their permission to add in our group. So you can, if you have any questions related to conversion and optimization, you can reach Kali and anything social media, of course reach out to Roti, Rajita, so he's available for that. And in case if you have any questions, specific questions about the, I mean, Rajita, personally, I received this question from our group asking about the travel and tourism. Can, can we ask that question to Rajita? But to in order to maintain the time, please. So he's available in our thread. Maybe you can raise the question. Or he already shared his contact detail. Please reach yeah. out to him. Make sure, use the, uh, the chances to make sure get get the things in a proper way that you want to use it. So once again, once again, guys, thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a great yeah. weekend. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.